that really makes me think of, of uh, the, the two uh, plaintiffs sitting here whose personal story is what's propelling, you know, some of the, the court battle forward right now. As uh, each of the four of you panelists go forward speaking, and, and you do, and, and representing this cause around the country, um, meeting a lot of people from a, a variety of perspectives, is the conversation changing uh, across the board? Is there a sea change going on, or is, does the majority of the work lie ahead of us in terms of getting people to accept the concept of uh, marriage equality uh, across the sociopolitical spectrum? Well, I, um, I would say that in our experience that it's really boiled down to equality. It's not really about marriage. Marriage comes along with the law, and the law is very clear to us. So what we've learned in our, in our lawsuit is that the law states one thing, and the one thing is that everyone should have access to this privilege, to this, you know, by being prohibited the access to marriage, you run into a different <laughs> argument, and that argument is on the argument of quality. And in our state, it's we have, what, three or four different levels of equality now with marriage equality. We have those who can be married, um, heterosexual couples. We have the homosexual couples that were married during the window of opportunity. Then we have people who are married outside who now, I had a friend yesterday text me and said, hey, if we get married in New York now, can we come back to California and be recognized? And we absolutely can be. And then there's us who, who didn't want to necessarily be stuck in a parenthetical time frame of our, you know, when we could get married, to be forced into a window because we have big families and there's a lot, you know, but our families are like, wait a second, we have to put this together. So, <laughs> trust. Italian, Brazilian families. Like, oh, no, no, no. You are not getting married before this date. So, that being said, you know, we were, the, the, what Ted, Ted and David call a crazy quilt of equality in this country and specifically in our state. So what we learned is that if you take marriage out of the equation and you just talk, talk about the law and you talk about what everyone deserves as an American under our Constitution, it's very clear. And the conversations that we have really go to that place and say, listen, it's not about your disapproval of our life. It's not about what your morality or what your faith is telling you. In fact, there's protections for that as well under the law. So you can believe what you want to believe. I've never said to someone what you believe is wrong. I can feel that way because of how I live my life and because of my experiences, but I can say, listen, what I'm asking you to do is just see it in a different perspective. So rather than exploding the box, like everyone is presenting marriage equality as, you know, kick the box over and look at it from our perspective. And if you do that, the conversation then lands in a place where there is no defense against the equality for marriage. So what our goal is, just like Lance was saying and Reed is saying, is that we just go in and go, we're regular guys. I don't wear gay on my sleeve. You know, I just don't. I have a lot of other things in my life that I, you know, we're, we're good uncles, we're great uncles. We're like good friends to our families and friends and we do, uh, we pay our taxes, we have a home, we're in our community. So I don't have to wear gayness as a badge to get my equality. It should just come with our lives as is. So I think that's where the conversation's going is in terms of like, this is our legal right and that will associate us in a way to the world that brings other associations and rights with it. The court case, when we were building the court case at AFAIR, uh, it was like, it was five of us. And I think one of the early conversations uh, as we built it was how do we take this out of the red-blue divide? We cannot make this case um, a liberal versus conservative, Democrat versus Republican thing. We, gotta, we need to start fighting it like a civil rights fight. Uh, and and, and I, I do believe that's how history will remember this, not as a red-blue thing. And so that's why it was constructed with, I, do you guys know this case? With Theodore Olson was the hero of the right, you know, argued for Bush in Bush v. Gore, but also Ted Olson, who was the hero of the left at the Supreme Court level, and argued for Gore in Bush v. Gore. And, and David, I'm sorry. The way around. The way around. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. That was the cocktails last night. Uh, but, but it has really taken the conversation to a new place, which it hadn't been. You were talking about this sort of, this patchwork of equality, of how people see our equality. And it, you know, it started really when, when uh, Theodore Olson wrote the conservative case for gay marriage on Newsweek, and that's really uh, caught fire. And now it's okay to be a conservative or a Republican who believes in equality for gay and lesbian people. And that, I don't think that door was really open uh, in, until this case started, and illustrating that that was a possibility, and, and that you could have libertarian arguments and constitutional arguments for equality. So hopefully it is changing, and as I go, you know, because the, the end goal 
for marriage is national marriage, and that's what this case does for the first time. This means marriage in my home state of Texas. But I also believe that on our way there, we have to make sure that uh, we're bringing the country along with us and that we're helping them understand why this is important for their community to accept and include gay and lesbian people, which is the hard work we've been doing at AFAIR sort of behind the scenes. Um, and, I, and I hope, I do think it's changing. I mean, if you look at the polls, we got, we're up to 55% approval nationwide for gay marriage. I almost can't believe that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, but yeah, I think, I think it is working. It's working by uh, us including other people in the conversation, going to them. It was a beautiful sermon today, but going to them uh, and going to their neighborhood sharing who we are there. Yeah. Talking and telling our stories is the most important thing we can do. People people come up to Paul and I all the time and ask, you know, how can we be involved? What can we do? And the one thing I tell them is keep doing what you're doing. Talking to your family, talking to your friends and coworkers and your neighbors. Tell them who you are. Let them know who you are. Be out and be proud. But at the same because at the same time, people will get to know you and they realize that you are just like them. And they some sometimes realize, well, why shouldn't they have the same rights as me? So, you know, I think this has become the, really the national message around all of the organizations that are doing this great work with marriage equality is tell your stories. Because when you tell your stories, you change hearts and minds. And that's so key. And I think furthering the message, I, I'm glad that we've sort of, one of the things Paul and I have talked about with the whole New York thing is I'm so glad that it's now I don't like it being called same-sex marriage. I mean, it should be called marriage equality, and it's become, that's the terminology we need to use, is marriage equality. That's, that's really key there. I want to ask uh, a perhaps a difficult question. Um, Dustin, I, like you, really appreciated uh, the sermon this morning. Reed, you didn't have a, an opportunity to hear it, but one of the points that uh, Kathy made early on in the sermon was that our having this conversation here today is not intended uh, as a slight to the Church of Latter-day Saints or to Mormons at all, but simply to, to ask and raise some questions. But there is a divide, and we're seeing an increasing divide in America between not just denominations, but between faiths. When we look at this heightened degree of religious divisiveness, what is at the heart of the struggle? What is going on for us as a nation? Where did this come from? And how do we address it? Perhaps, yeah. uh, we've got audience member that wants to speak, yes. Uh, are, are we open? Yes, we are, absolutely. Oh. Well, I would like to address three things. First of all, Proposition 8 and voter apathy. Now, if there's anyone here like myself, I when I got my ballot, it went down into an archaeological dig area. In other words, I didn't immediately study it, okay? But when I saw the parade, I was on a bus when they had the parade out coming from Santa Monica, and I saw no on Prop 8, and I was talking to someone about it, and then I learned. Now then I went home, dug out the ballot, and I 